Good morning, everybody. Pastor Mike here with another Watchman Pure Bible Study, Galatians chapter 3. We're going to try to close out the chapter today, verses 24 through 29. Paul said, or the Holy Ghost says, through Paul, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Now remember, the idea of a schoolmaster is like a disciplinarian. Uh, It's training us. The Bible talks about training up a child, and that training, according to the Scripture, should come with a rod. It comes with punishment. It comes with there is pain associated with doing wrong things. So the law was mean and cruel and hard and vicious and, and unbending. God needed it. We needed it that way. That was to bring us to the cross. Then our faith in the cross and the finished work of Christ is what brings us salvation. So, and I want you to get this. Verse 26, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, not by the law, but by faith. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And we're going to talk about that. Um, There is neither uh, Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus, and if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, verses 24 and 25, we see the difference in the purpose between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament brings us to the cross, the New Testament carries us up into glory. It's sort of like the difference between Moses and Joshua. Moses can get us out of the promised land. Joshua is the only one who can get us, uh, or excuse me, Moses can get us out of Egypt. Cannot get you into the promised land. Only Joshua can do that. And so the law brings us to the cross, Christ's crucifixion and his atonement for our sins, then his resurrection and the new life in the New Testament brings us into the promised land, brings us into heaven. Here's the difference. And we're going to bring in the book of James into this. And here's how I see this. The transition in a person's life, like mine or yours, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. It's like in the Old Testament, we do things because we have to do them like being children. When I was a child, I thought as a child, I did things. I did childish things. And I did things because I had to do them. My parents made me do them. But when you grow up and become a man or become a woman, you grow up and mature. You don't do things because you have to. You do things because you want to. They're in your heart. And they're part of your life. They're part of who you are. So even though you're doing the same things, there's a difference now. I don't have to be made and forced into coming to church, uh, preaching the sermons. No one's making me and forcing me to sit here. There's not a contract that I have with our church that says I have to do, you know, pure Bible study, watchman broadcast, PM. I don't. These were all things that I wanted to do. So I'm doing them by faith. I'll give you the example. We had a Christian school here for years, and we used the uh, Accelerated Christian Education curriculum. And one of the things that I noticed about it was it, it teaches a lot of self-discipline, uh, self-instruction. And we, you know, there was enough of us adults there that guided in that but primarily goal setting. When the students came in every day, they set goals for themselves. Now, if they didn't set high enough goals, they didn't finish the work on time, they were behind. Um, And I noticed that there was a difference when we would have 20 or 30 students here. I noticed there was a difference, and I learned, I called one group of students Old Testament students and another group New Testament students. The Old Testament students, when they came in, they had to be made to do practically everything that they were supposed to do here. They had to be made to set the right amount of goals per day. They had to be made to um, stay busy at their work. 
we had to monitor them all the time. They didn't have a lot of freedom here. We had to monitor their breaks. We had to monitor practically everything that they did, and they didn't like it. They didn't like being under our direct supervision. They didn't like someone telling them what to do every five minutes. But the problem is they wouldn't do it on their own. They cheated. They lied. They were lazy. They talked out of turn. They did things they were not supposed to do. They were Old Testament students. They were constantly under discipline. And for the most part, they never changed. But then we had New Testament students. Now, and I'll tell you this, the Old Testament students hated the New Testament students. The New Testament students, they came in, they filled out more than enough goals every day. We didn't have to tell them, now get busy every five minutes. They did their work. They got longer breaks. They didn't have to be monitored at every break to make sure that they were going to obey the rules. They, um, they just did everything that needed to be done, plus some, because it was the right thing to do. And they did it with a minimum of supervision. And, and I just, I got a lot of wisdom out of that. And that is how it is. When a, when a person is truly born again, Bible-believing Christian, they're not here in church because they have to be. They're here because they want to be. They don't give in the offering plate because they have to, because I'm going to come down on them if they don't. They do it because they want to. And the truth of it is, I don't, as a, as a pastor, I don't want people's money because they feel like they're obligated to give or they have to give because I rain down on them if they don't. I want the free will offerings, and so does God. So there, there is that difference in a person when he's no longer doing things under the schoolmaster because he has to. He's doing them because he wants to do them because he knows that they are the right thing. There comes a time when a man, dis, when a man is going to remain faithful to his wife, not because he's afraid of getting caught, not because he's, uh, you know, afraid of he might get a divorce and might lose half his stuff. He stays faithful to his wife because he loves her. He doesn't want to be with anybody else. You see the difference? That's what, that's what James is talking Turn to James chapter 2, verse 14. This idea about James and works and faith, and, and some people just, they... Boy, they get hung up on this thing. Some even say that James is showing you a different gospel, a gospel of works rather than great. I, 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 don't, I do not believe that. Not for a second do I believe that. Because what James is saying here is that there are fake and phony Christians who make it look good on the outside, who say they have faith. But the truth of it is they don't have faith. And how do you know they don't have faith? Because the works don't show forth what they say on the outside. Oh, I believe in Jesus Christ. Yeah, right. They're not doing anything in life that shows that they really believe that. Uh, you know, t let's, let's, just, let's just take you for an example, okay? You are a born-again, Bible-believing Christian. Um, are you interested in joining the First Church of Satan in San Francisco, California? No, you're not. Are you interested in studying the uh, Satanic Bible to gain uh, great advanced knowledge? No. Are you interested in saying, Hail Satan! You, are you interested in doing anything like that? No. Why not? You don't believe in that. You believe that's wrong. You believe that's wicked. That's my point. What you do believe in is the Bible. You believe in the faith of Jesus Christ. You believe in God's only Son. You believe in uh, the cross of Jesus Christ, the blood atonement. You believe that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. You believe in gathering the saints together, okay? not, not forsaking the assembling of the saints together. These are things that you believe in. And you believe in them so strongly that that's what dictates your life. These are the things you are in church. You are reading your Bible. You are praying to God. 
you're trying to live a holy and a decent and a clean life. Why? Because that's what you believe in. James chapter 2, verse 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save it? Though a man say he hath faith. There's the key right there. Because a lot of people, oh, I believe in God. Oh, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. And we go, yeah, right. It's not that we like going around judging everybody, but you don't see them praying. They don't, they don't read a Bible. Never touch it. Never in church. Okay? Never testifying of the grace of Almighty God. They're not, they don't do anything that you see Christians do. That you, There is an expectation that Christians do. You don't see them do any of that. So can it be really can you really believe someone who says they have faith and yet there is nothing that display they instead of you seeing them in church praying reading their bible or even at their home praying reading their bible or sharing Jesus with someone instead of seeing that you see them off you see them offering people a beer you see them at the tavern you see them at the dance hall you see them out at the gambling casinos you see them doing everything in, in worldly in life except what Bible Christians do. So they say they have faith, but you don't see the fruit. You don't see the works of it. What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto him, Depart in peace, be you warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. And I will show thee my faith by my works. And it's very simple. You will always do what you really believe. Not what you say you believe, but what you really believe. You'll be loyal to what you really believe in. You say that you love your wife and you believe in marriage between one man and one woman for life. And yet you're out looking at every other woman in the world, looking and you're on the internet chatting with gals online, trying to hook up with people. You've got eyes. Every woman that walks by, you're trying to get her eyes to look at you. So maybe you got. You don't. You don't love your wife. You don't believe in marriage. You will do and be loyal to what you really believe in. Okay, it's that's it's that simple. So, if you are truly born again, truly have the seal of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, God's word working, a living inside of you, there will be the outward manifestation of that faith. But if you just say you have faith, but you don't really, it will be manifested in your works. All right. Now, I like this part. Okay. I started thinking about this and I'm going... Yeah, I'm going to run with this. Let's have a little fun, all right? Back to Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. I want you to think about that and get this picture. When you are baptized into Christ, I, mean, I don't mean just water baptized, I mean... Holy Ghost filled, baptized, born again, you're the new man, all right? When we're baptized into Christ, we have, the Bible says we put on Christ, which means Christ literally is our covering. So when God looks at us, instead of seeing Mike Hoggard, the filthy, low-down, disgusting, scumhead sinner, who does he see? Christ. He then gives the inheritance, the blessings, seated at the right hand of the Father. I mean, all, all of that. I am a joint heir with Christ because I am in Christ. If I have put on Christ, that means I am in Christ. You're going to like this. Okay? 
Ephesians 4.24, that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. True holiness, not the fake holiness that people put on on the outside. They make it like they're really holy on the outside, but they're not. Okay? So you put on the new man. Colossians 3.10, have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So when we put on Christ, we put on, literally, it's like being clothed upon with a, with a new body or a, a new, I'm a new man, I'm a new person. I am not what I used to be. I was sitting thinking about that this morning, praying about it. So God, I, I, I'm not where I need to be, but I thank you that I'm not where I used to be. Thank you, God, for that. Okay, I'm a long way away from what I used to be. Why? Because I put on the new man. Second Corinthians 5, 3. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. What was Adam and Eve realized after they sinned, after they ate the fruit, what did they realize? They were naked. What was their desire to be clothed upon? What did they do? They tried to sew themselves fig leaves together. They tried to cover themselves and it was insufficient. So for that, for we that are in this tabernacle do groan being burdened. Not for that we should be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Revelation 3, 5. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Notice this. He's going to be clothed in white raiment. Verse uh, Revelation 7, 9. After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues. Nations, kindred, peoples, tongues. How'd we get that way? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All right. Stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. How did we get the white robes? We were given those white robes. Look at Revelation 19, 8. In fact, Turn there. Herein um, is one of the differences between the King James and all the other translations. Um, I wanted to be derogatory there. I'm trying to refrain myself because I want to teach people that maybe you're watching me and you're not having quite convinced yet. Let me show you some of the differences. Revelation 19:8. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. The new translations, almost without fail, they all agree to the exact opposite of what the King James says. Because in all the modern translations, they will say something to the effect of The fine linen is the righteous deeds or the righteous acts of saints or of the saints. And I'm going to read the King James again. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. That has been granted to us to be to put on. We got permission to wear Christ's righteousness. We have put on Christ. We have put on the new man. It we have overcome therefore it has been given to us to wear these white fine linen robes and those robes represent the righteousness that was granted to us not the righteousness that we perform because the bible says um, that all of our works of righteousness are as filthy rags in god's sight And so, if, as the new translations say, that what we have, what we put on in Revelation 19 is our righteous deeds or our righteous acts, those righteous deeds are filthy rags in God's sight. And so, herein lies the difference. We do nothing to merit our own righteousness, it is granted to us by way of the righteousness of of Jesus Christ. Mm-mm-mm. Well, I love that. Now, I'm going to give you some numbers, okay? It's one number in particular, and I'm just, just going to let me have my fun today, all right? 
I was reading that verse in Galatians. For you are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's a number here. All right. Turn to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, starting in verse 23, you'll notice the Bible says, And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. So in Luke chapter 3, verse 23, we start with Jesus. We go to Joseph. We go to Heli. We're going to skip some verses. Not going to read the whole thing. We go down to verse 38 which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. So we have the lineage of Jesus going from Jesus in, in chapter 3, verse 23, all the way down to God in verse 38, through Adam, which was the son of God. Okay, it's pretty cool the way it says that. If you were to count these names, and I did, okay, it's exactly 77 of those, 77. Uh, seven's the number for sanctification, purification. It's the number for, it's the number associated with God, uh, the seven spirits of God, and so on, all right? So we have a, a pure line from Jesus going all the way back to God, and that number is 77. Now think about this in terms of the, uh, the rights to the inheritance. God going, passing down the seed all the way to Jesus through Adam, all right? So Jesus is in a direct line from Adam. Of course, we all are. Jesus is in a direct line from Adam, and it shows that he is the rightful heir to all things from God his Father, all right? 77 names here. If you download the Pure Bible Search software at purebiblesearch.com, and type in the word church 77 times exactly 77 times 77 names in the lineage here determining the inheritance now let me tie these two ideas together the church and Christ all right the first occurrence of the word church Matthew 16:18 thou art Peter and upon this rock I will build my church the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The last occurrence of the word church, 77th occurrence of the word church. Very important because you're going to see something in a minute. Revelation 3, 14, under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. One day I decided to go to the 77th verse of the Bible. 77th verse of the Bible. If you, uh, if you download the software, you can find the 77th verse of the Bible. You can actually pull a little a slider down and slide and find the 77th verse of the Bible. Okay? It's Genesis 3.21. Here's what it says. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Well, that is a picture of what we see in Galatians 3 where... We are, now that we are baptized in Christ, we have put on Christ. See, Adam and Eve tried to dress themselves, and to God it was insufficient. God is the one who clothed Adam and Eve. He gave them coats of skins, and the implication is, is that there was a, an animal that died. Something had to die for Adam and Eve to be clothed upon by God himself. But he covered them in coats of of skins all right so i want you to get this the 77th verse is where god clothes adam and eve the 77th occurrence of the word church is the church of the laodiceans what's wrong with the laodiceans look in verse 17 of revelation 3 because thou sayest i am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked i counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eyes that thou mayest see isn't that amazing the 77th verse of the bible 
is God clothing Adam and Eve to cover up their nakedness. And the 77th occurrence of the word church, which is the last one, is the church of Laodiceans where Jesus is saying, you need to be clothed in fine linen so that your nakedness do not appear. I'm just, you know what? I'm just giving you facts. Now, I, I am convinced that these manifest the idea that this Bible is in order. It has an order to it, a beautiful order to it. Now, something to keep in mind with these numbers, okay? I don't worship these numbers, and I, I never use numbers or counting things as a replacement for doctrine, number one. Number two, I never let these numbers stand in the way of... Anytime I see a number like this, there has to be a, a plain written doctrine in the Bible that matches that. And that's what I'm showing you. 77th occurrence of the word church, church of Laodiceans. What's wrong with the Laodiceans? They're naked. What do they need to have? They need to be clothed upon so they're not naked. The 77th verse of the Bible is God clothing Adam and Eve. To me, there's a connection there doctrinally. All right? Now, another. So that's the word church 77 times. The lineage of Christ, 77 names in here. Okay, now, there's another phrase that's mentioned 77 times in the King James Bible. It's the phrase, in Christ. If you will notice, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Part of that 77 occurrences of the phrase, in Christ let me give you some verses where that phrase, in Christ, remember it's 77 times exactly. The church is 77 times. Christ's name, 77 names. The church is in Christ, right? Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Isn't that cool? 2 Corinthians 2, 14, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. See, if you're in Christ, you don't lose. You can't lose. If we're in Christ, Christ wins everything. That means we win. And maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Second Corinthians three fourteen. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Second Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's what, that matches Galatians 3, 26 uh, and 27. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as you as have put, been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in, in Christ Jesus. Says it again. Okay. This, this stuff is beautiful. Galatians 3, 26. There it is. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ. Christ Jesus. Now I'm going to add another word to this. All forms of the word baptize, like baptize, baptized, baptizing. 77 times in King James Bible. Let me read some verses. Okay? The 77th occurrence of all those words, baptize, baptized, baptizing, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. <laughs> put on Christ. 77th verse, Adam and Eve clothed with skin. 77th occurrence of the word church, Laodiceans. They need to put on the white robes. All forms of the word Passover. 77 times. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover. 
his sacrifice for us. Christ, our Passover, 77 times, uh, 77 names in the lineage of Jesus, church 77 times. It means that it shows that we are joint heirs with Christ because we are in Christ. Uh, let me let me do this. Um, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 again. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Think of being in Christ as like Noah being in the ark. And we have eight. Eight's a number for new life and new beginnings. Eight people in the ark. They are in Christ. And in Genesis 8, eight people come out of the ark and they see that the old things have passed away and behold all things have become new isn't it beautiful I just I love uh, I, again the, the numbers don't replace Bible doctrine they don't stand in the way they don't contradict Bible doctrine they to me they show like the framework of God's doctrine. They never contradict the doctrine that you see in the Bible. What you can plainly read without counting anything. What you can plainly read and understand. What I've seen out of these numbers is that they match what the Bible says and the way it says it. To me these numbers show forth the order. Everything in the universe is in order. The sun, moon, and the stars are in order. The way that waves come in off out of the ocean. There is an order to that. There is a, there's a ratio to that. I mean, the Fibonacci sequence, I've talked about that. There is an order to everything in the, in the universe. The book that made that is in order as well. And I just, I love to talk about that every now and then just to show forth that not only are the doctrines of this Bible right, there is a beautiful, beautiful order to this book that really just nails it with me concerning its inspiration its perfection its divine completion God's signature is in this book I love to talk about it all right it's good to be with you today God bless you I hope this was a blessing to you Keep studying this book. Always think Bible in everything that you say and do. And we'll see you next time. All right? Bye-bye.